Good morning. Great to see so many familiar faces, and I know that some people have gone to great lengths to get here today. I was speaking to one woman this morning who got up at four o'clock and travelled from uh, Limerick to be here today, travelled on the bus. So there are other people I know have come from as far afield as Donegal, other parents. So thank you very much for your interest in today, and we hope that the Minister is able to join us shortly. So I'm going to give a short presentation called Enabling Good Lives for People. So before I talk about individual budgets, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the current context in Ireland. And, you know, as many of you would be aware, actions to reform disability services and to improve the lives of people with disabilities, oh, by the way, my presentation is going to focus particularly on people with intellectual disabilities and autism <coughs> and will reference families because we're a family-based organisation and although we do work with adults, we often work with them in the context of their families. So I just want to be very clear about that. So, actions to reform disability services and to improve the lives of people with disabilities have to date focused almost exclusively on the supply side. And we believe in LEAP that in order to transform disability services and to enact positive and lasting change in people's lives, we must also put in place mechanisms on the demand side and develop what we call the landscape of support, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a while. So one such mechanism, and it is only a mechanism, is individual budgets, which give people who require support more choice and control over that support. So why individualised funding? So if we, if we step back and we think about people's lives <coughs> and improving people's lives and what's important in people's lives, we know that across the life course, our well-being is achieved through our relationships, our sense of belonging, and our roles such as son, daughter, student, church member, scout or scout leader, neighbour, employee, and so on. So the, the key to maximising the effective use of individual budgets <coughs> is to assist people and families to use them to build an ordinary life with relationships, belonging, and valued roles. So I mentioned a new landscape of support. So what do I mean by that? So if today we understand better the centrality of love and relationships in the lives of all people, and no more so in the lives of those who are at risk of exclusion and rejection, and if we know that institutions in Ireland are becoming a thing of the past, the old models of support are being decommissioned but what are we putting in their place? We need to put in place new community-based supports to build the resilience of people and families and not simply abandon people to their own resources. So if individualised funding is to work, perhaps it needs to be underpinned by some key community-based components. And what would they look like? What would they specifically be? They might be things like supportive networks of people and families who are accessing individual budgets, because it can be quite an isolating thing. We, we think, anecdotally, that possibly 300 people and families across the Republic of Ireland are using individual budgets. We don't know. In fact, possibly the HSE don't know. But that can be very isolating for those families unless they're linked into other <coughs> individuals and families who are using individual budgets. So people also then need knowledge, access to information. In LEAP we get calls and emails and letters and we meet people all the time. How do you do this? You know, what's this about? I'm really curious about this, but I've honestly no idea to start. And that might be with families with children as young as three years old. Um, in fact, LEAP for the last four years has, has run 
a retreat, an annual family leadership retreat, where we bring 10 such curious families away and we talk to them about a good life and perhaps using a piece of money, a piece of individualized funding to support and to strengthen what is already there in the family. So support to live a typical life in community uh, because that can be a struggle. People face discrimination, they face rejection. We know this. These systemic barriers and attitudinal barriers are real. They do exist and they impact heavily on people and on families. Opportunities to share stories of success and to demonstrate what is possible and a kind of an appreciative listening and a, an understanding that these stories, they take careful uh, weaving and putting together intentional thought and discussion and you know, we need to notice that, and we need to notice that together. And then lastly, practical and financial support is required. <coughs> A nice one. So, using individual budgets to create good lives, isn't that what we're at? So, I would say that individual budgets are a means, not an end in themselves. They're not a magic bullet. An individual budget will not create a good, meaningful, rich, inclusive life. You cannot buy a good life, and neither can you place the responsibility for a good life at the door of the service system. We know this. However, an individual budget paired with a vision of a good life for a person is far more likely to lead to a good life, a typical life. But there are no guarantees. So essential elements for successful utilization of individualized funding, and I've put in brackets, you know, money can't do this. Assisting families to develop and extend their vision, lifestyle planning and goal setting, putting plans into action, building informal networks, and safeguarding and issues around sustainability and succession planning. These are the pieces, the landscape of support that organizations need to offer. And I'm not particularly talking about disability service providers. They will have a part to play in this, yes. But we need new community-based, person and family-led, small organizations at grassroots level that can do some of this work if individualized budgets are to work. So it's really the intentional application of money we're talking about to support good lives, but it's not really about the money. By the way, my eldest son has uh, had an individual budget since leaving school four and a half years ago. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. The funding simply allows for the person to connect to the valued world using tailored support and it is holding a shared vision of a good life that will get the person to where they want to be. The money can't do that. So, on, on the issue of value for money, we, we can say from the research internationally that individual budgets cost less in the aggregate this means that while some people's support will cost more, the majority will offer cost savings. And to recognize the value to be gained fiscally and socially when people with disabilities become active social and economic contributors, part of the prosperity of a community rather than dependence. However, in terms of the value for money argument, integration has to be seen as a goal, not as a way of minimizing cost. We're not just doing this to save money. So individual budgets are part of a wider context of global reform of social services, away from a focus on needs, which creates dependency to approaches which build relationships and valued roles of a person, but does not divorce them from the context of their natural supports, for example, family and regular <coughs> community members. 
Um, I was in Australia a couple of years ago, and there uh, I met a number of family-led uh, collectives where 10, usually 10, 8, 10, 12 families had banded together in one collective where their adult children were considered too difficult to serve individually. And they'd banded together as collectives and they'd got their funding. They'd employed uh, usually a service coordinator to work with each of their family members and they'd got going. And, and one of the things I remember a particular family leader um, some of you may have heard of or indeed met, uh, called Mark Ward from Brisbane, saying that, you know, Rachel, you know, we had, we had two options and, and they weren't really good options. We either abandoned our natural authority as families to service providers and lost all uh, say in what happened to our family member, or we did the whole uh, self-management thing where we were very, very isolated, and it was quite a lonely experience. So we came together in a collective, and this feels a lot more comfortable. Having said that, most of those families now are hitting into 60s and, 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 and 70s, and they are coming up hard against issues around succession planning. So some of the challenges, just to wrap up, the biggest one, as, as we would see it, is raising the culturally held low expectations of people with disabilities. Understanding and really believing the complementary nature of services. Believing in the natural authority of families. Creating flexible systems, a light touch, not heavy bureaucracy that people can't cope with. Making it available to adults, children, families, and unpaid carers. In many countries that we've visited, there is also an option for unpaid carers, sometimes called family carers, to receive an individual budget to support them in their carer, caring role. That's a fair deal, guys. <laughs> and lastly, you cannot self-direct provide a controlled service. So although where people haven't done the competency building piece, haven't thought long and hard about a vision of a good life, an ordinary life with valued roles, again, the research shows us internationally that they simply buy back the traditional service because it's porridge. What do you have then? I'll have porridge. So they go back to the day service. And that's, that's not really what this is about. So I'll end there uh, with those thoughts and reflections. Thank you. <laughs>